Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I just thank you for this day that you have made. Another day where we get to um, live, Lord, and serve you, Lord. It's such a privilege to serve you, and it's a privilege that you loved us enough, Lord, that even when we were sinners, you died for us, Lord. And Lord, we, I pray we never lose sight of our salvation, and I pray that we focus our lives on serving you and telling other people about you. Lord, I pray you be with Pastor Ezzy preaches, Lord, and I pray if there's someone here who is not saved, today will be the day of their salvation. Lord, I pray that they don't put it off. I pray that they don't get distracted, Lord, but today they decide to trust you as Savior, Lord. And Lord, I pray um, everything brings honor and glory to you. I pray for all these things in your son's name. Amen. You may be seated. All right, for our next song. We're going to sing Worthy of Praise. There we go. My heart overflows with praise to the Lord.
let me give you a few announcements if I can. Uh, again, just reminder, we, we are going to have an offertory in just a moment, okay, even though we're not taking up an offering, okay, uh, but the offering plates are uh, back outside the doors there uh, after the service if you'd like to, uh, again, uh, be obedient in tithes and offerings, the plates are out there, okay. Uh, announcements again, just reminding you that every Sunday morning at 5 after 9 in uh, Toddlin Sunday School Room, 9.05 to 9.20, there's a prayer time. If you're interested in that, we'd love to have you be a part of that. Uh, we start right on time. So if you get here at 9.06, the door will already be shut, okay? And we try to be out right at 9.20 because of Sunday School and other things that we have going on there. Uh, for those that are, uh, well, hold on, let's do the men's prayer breakfast again is uh, uh, Tuesday at 8 o'clock. If you have the day off or you're retired, I'd like to come up and just talk and have a, a time of fellowship. Uh, we do that every Tuesday morning, 8 o'clock at Burger King. This week, Wednesday, back to our regular Wednesday night services, 6 o'clock. At 6 o'clock, again, the adults will be in here. The, uh, we'll have kids club. We'll have a teen club. Uh, back to our Pastor Ryan and Miss Gabby. Again, those will be... Uh, I guess I didn't ask about the kids club deal, but I'll check on that. But uh, Wednesday night, back to our normal regular services, although I've enjoyed the summer <coughs> having uh, folks come and preach and share God's Word. It's been a great, a great summer uh, together Tuesday. Uh, VBS, there are still flyers. Thank you for all those who came and stuffed bags yesterday and handed out over in Culver. Uh, we've had no issues with anybody. People are very polite and gracious to us. If we, we don't purposely knock on doors and talk with people, but there have been a couple people outside, and we've done that. They've taken it. Nobody's ever been offended by anything, so we're good about doing that. So we had North Judson covered, and we have uh, uh, Culver covered. Pastor Ryan has done all that uh, work, and we want to get, keep doing that. We'll let you know about this Saturday um, with Knox. We're hoping that the Knox School will hand out the flyers for us. They've, they've done that for Good News Club in the past for the elementary, but this is not Good News Club, not sure. But we're hoping that they'll send them home for the kids so we won't have to do this area. They'll do that for us. If not, uh, then Saturday we will try to start right away and, and get as much as Knox covered as we can. But we'll probably do... I didn't talk to Pastor Ryan yet, but what we'll probably do is Friday night, if a few of you can come and finish stuffing the envelopes or the, the bags, we'll do that. And we'll probably start right at 9 o'clock Saturday and go and get as much done at, uh, up until noon as we can. And then we'll call that good, okay? Be praying about VBS. Uh, so Chase, Chase Williams will be here, uh, magic guy. I'm telling you, young kids will absolutely love that. Uh, he'll be preaching to the teens next week, Sunday, during the Sunday school hour. Uh, the adults will have their regular Sunday school class and all the other kids, but Sunday morning and Sunday night, uh, he will be preaching to us. And then the kids, Monday through Thursday, 5.30 to 7.30 at VBS. Again, please be inviting people. But there's plenty of flyers there if you'd like to take those and hand those out. Uh, the, August the 15th, uh, all day Sunday, so Sunday morning and Sunday night, uh, Pastor Pendle's going to be challenging us as believers at the area of counseling. Counseling is important not just for somebody who's a uh, counselor for a living, but for every believer, we need to give biblical answers to people's issues, not our opinions and things. And, and Pastor's going to go over that. He's very good in the area of counseling, and he's going to share some things with us Sunday morning and Sunday night. I encourage you to come to both of those services. We have a responsibility uh, to one another, to help encourage one another, and, and Pastor's going to bring those things out uh, on the August the 15th. August the 16th is Faith Bible Institute begins uh, from 6 till 9. Uh, after the morning service, those that are in that class, if you see Miss Misty and get your books, okay, get your books for class August 16th. If you haven't signed up and you'd like to still do that, see Miss Misty about that. I'm sure we can work something out for you to be able to participate in that class. For those that are in the 10th grade on up, you know, uh, you could, these classes will go toward college credits. Yes, even at some of the public uh, colleges. I, I have a list if you're interested to see if the college you might be going to, if they'll take those credits, I can give you that list, okay? So it's a cheap way to earn some credits for you. Uh, I would encourage you to do that. Uh, August 21st, teen activity of the South Bend Cuds game. Again, if you have any questions, see Pastor Ryan about that. Ladies, say the date, October uh, the 8th and 9th Ladies Retreat. We'll be leaving the church here between 3 and 4 on the 7th. Uh, in September, Ladies Bible Study. Here's the information that I have for ladies for the Bible study. Uh, you'll be meeting the first Thursday of every month from 12 until 2. It says carry in lunch. There's a sign-up sheet and books are at the Welcome Center. Okay, books for your Bible studies. That's starting in September, the first Thursday in September. 
October the 9th, again, is a teen event, Rekindle at Indianapolis. Again, if you have questions, see Pastor Ryan about that. Now, ladies, again, uh, walking uh, exercise Monday, Wednesday, Friday from 1 until 3. Uh, I see Mrs. Kreider back there. Today's her birthday. Okay, so happy birthday, Mrs. Kreider. Okay, I'll have Brother Don sing to you before we sing our next song. But uh, again, let me remind you again, we are not passing the offering plate at this time. It is back there in the doors, but uh, at this time, Miss Sarah's going to play an, an offertory for us, okay?
Amen. All right, if you're able to stand, if you join me in standing. As we sing our final congregational this morning, all for Jesus. beneath his wings all for Jesus all for Jesus resting now beneath his wings all for Jesus all for Jesus resting now beneath his wings amen you may be seated Joseph went to Egypt land, he wasn't there alone. He knew the Lord was there with him, though he was far from home. In every task that Joseph had, he did as he should. Though others meant to do him harm, God meant it all for good. God is good through every trial and test. God is good. And I know his way is best. Even when I cannot see the purpose of his plan, still I understand God is. God sends to you and seek the Lord each day. When things are tough, God's strong enough to help you find your way. Remember Joseph trusted God 
did the best he could. In every trial Joseph found, God meant it all for good. God is good through every trial and test. God is good, and I know his way is best. Even when I cannot see the purpose of his plan, still I understand God is good, still I understand. Thank you, Brother Joe. Appreciate that. You need to know that now that God is good because we will go through difficult times and then we will begin to question that. And but God is good. Brother Pete, just let me know that the TV is in the fellowship hall. If you think you're a little cramped here and like to go to the fellowship hall to watch it on the, the TV, you can go ahead and do that. At this time, no, we are still good for kids' club or kids' church, children's church, whatever it's called. That's something there, I'll get it right. Children's church, four years old up through the fourth grade, and go ahead and be dismissed at this time. Four years old up through the fourth grade can be dismissed as they head back there for children's church thank you for the teenagers that are working that it's giving them experience and learning to serve but i also i think the kids enjoy uh being taught by the teenagers there so they're doing a good job back there i did forget to mention this to you this morning just want you to be aware that uh, we will have a missionary here tonight uh, I believe his name is Brother Alan Johnson, uh, bearing precious wings, bearing precious seed ministry. He'll be here tonight. He has family that lives in North Judson, and so he asked while he was in the neighborhood if he could swing by here and share his ministry with us. So we'll be doing that tonight. Uh, my wife and I will not be here tonight. Okay, so Pastor Ryan will be taking care of things. Uh, Jordan and Emily are having a baby today. Uh, so we are on our way down there, hopefully make it in time. I don't know if we will or not, but her family will be there from Florida as well. And so we'll be hopefully welcoming our second grandson into this world this afternoon. So that's where we'll be tonight there and uh, see about being at uh, uh, Grace Baptist Church in Muncie. Okay? Let me just start by reading to you John chapter 8. Don't turn there. That's not what we're going to be. Okay? But I just want to read to you as a way of introduction this morning. John chapter 8, verses 7 through 9. And it says this. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. Verse 9 again says this. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience. I don't know what God has laid on my heart to share this morning about conviction, but something that Brother Mike shared with us this past week, and I was reading Luke chapter 22 uh, as part of my devotions this past week as well. So if you want to turn to Luke 22, uh, conviction. It's not as bad as we might think that it is. God has a purpose in convicting us, and we need to understand that. Conviction is a good thing. Conviction is that voice that your children hear when you're not around. Well, mom and dad said this. And you're hoping and begging and pleading that they listen to conviction, okay, so they don't get themselves in trouble, okay? Luke chapter 22, and it's the story, again, about Judas betraying Christ. We're not looking at that, but I want to look at three people this morning in this passage that was, that was convicted by Christ, Verse 47, we'll read down through verse 62 of Luke chapter 22. And while he yet spake, behold, a multitude, and he that was called Judas, one of the twelve, went before them and drew near unto Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said unto him, Judas, betrayest thou the Son of Man with a kiss? Now let me just, 
I, I hope you know, but let me just stop and say in the crazy world in which we live, it's not a kiss between a man and his wife, okay, or a man and a girl, not that kind of kiss. It's a way of greeting one another, okay? Don't misinterpret that. Again, we live in a crazy society where people want to read something, that all, Jesus was kissed by another man. No, it was a kiss on the cheek is a way of that they greeted one another, okay? Verse 49, when they which were about him saw what, he would, saw what would follow, they said unto him, Lord, shall we smite with the sword? And one of them smote the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. And Jesus answered and said, Suffer ye thus far. And he touched his ear and healed him. Then Jesus said unto the chief priests and captains of the temple and the elders which, came, which were come to him, Be ye come out as against a thief with swords and staves. When I was daily with you in the temple, you stretched forth no hands against me. But this is your hour and the power of darkness." Then took they him and led him and brought him into the high priest's house, and Peter followed afar off. And when they had kindled a fire in the midst of the, the hall and were set down together, Peter sat down among them. But a certain maid beheld him as he sat by the fire and earnestly looked upon him and said, This man was also with him. And he denied him, saying, Woman, I know, not, I know him not. And after a little while another saw him and said, Thou art also of them. And Peter said, Man, I am not. And about the space of one hour after another confidently affirmed, saying of a truth, this fellow also was with him, for he is Galilean. And Peter said, Man, I know not what thou sayest. And immediately, while he yet spake, the cock crew. And the Lord turned and looked upon Peter, and Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said unto him, Before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And Peter went out and wept bitterly. Why do we go through conviction? Have you ever stopped to think about that? Why is God convicting me of things? Well, number one is to reveal your sin or your corruption, your pollution that's entered into your heart, into your lifestyle, and God is convicting you for that. Now, again, that's not a bad thing, folks. Amen. We don't like to talk about that, and we don't want to know about that, but that's reality for the believer. In, Luke, in, in verse 48, it says, But Jesus said to him, Judas betrayest. The sin of Judas is to betray uh, the righteous king of kings and lord of lords. He's betraying him. That's his sin. And that's why Christ is confronting him. What about you and I? The Holy Spirit convicts us of our sin. In John chapter 16, verse 8 says, And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin. And yes, right here today, I guarantee you this. Somebody is going to be going under conviction. Just being reality, okay? In a crowd this size, there's conviction. Amen. Who's bringing that conviction? The Holy Spirit is bringing that conviction. It may be because you're lost, you never trusted Christ as your Savior. That may be the case. It may be that there's some sin in your life as a believer that you need to get that taken care of. Christ, God through the Holy Spirit, is convicting us of our sin. Now, again, instead of us getting mad and frustrated about that, we ought to embrace that, that we have a God who loves us enough to confront us, Amen. to convict us when we step out of line. Amen. Again, you'd like to think as parents that one day when your children grow up, they will come to you and say, you know, I'm sure glad that you had rules. I'm sure glad that you loved me. I'm sure glad that you kept me from this person or that person or from that thing or this thing. I'm thankful, Mom and Dad. Now, I don't know if kids ever do that very often or not, but you know what? When they get older, become parents, they begin to realize that the rules and things that Mom and Dad have weren't because they were mean and, and rotten parents, but because they loved you. Amen. And God loves us. And a loving God will not sit there and watch you go about your sinful ways without convicting you of that. Oh, we ought to thank God for that. But also, you know, the idea of convicting there is to reveal to us what is right. Okay? Again, conviction, what, what difference does it make me tell your kid he, he did wrong, he did wrong, he did wrong, if you never told him what was right to begin with? And God does that. Notice what it says here in verses 52 and 53, where it says this, Then Jesus said unto the chief priests and captains of the temple and the elders which were come to him, Be come out as against a thief with swords and staves. Now get this, verse 53. When I was daily with you in the temple, he stretched forth no hands against me. This is not the first time they heard Christ speak. 
They had heard him speak on other occasions. And you know what? They purposely came to hear him speak. And you know what? They never once threatened to haul him away or to kill him or anything else. Never did that happen. Why? Because they knew what he was saying was truth. They may not have liked it, but he was giving them truth. You know what? That's the way you and I are. God gives us truth in his word, even though, you know, oftentimes we don't like it. But again, do you not want to know the truth? How many of you like when people lie to you? Anybody like it when people lie to you? How many people have ever had somebody lie to them? Let me see your hands, first of all. Okay. Oh, yeah, probably everybody. Okay, yeah. And you knew that they were lying to you. That frustrates you. It frustrates me. But you know what? Why do we get angry with God when he gives us the truth? He tells us what is right. Why? In order to keep us from doing that, which is wrong. Again, why do we tell our children what is right? And again, parents remind you again, don't say because I said so. That's not good enough, okay? That's not good enough. Let them know why it is wrong. Again, in John chapter 16 and verse 13, it says this, Howbeit when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. Don't we love truth? Now again, not always, I understand that. But I'm thankful for truth. If it wasn't for truth, you and I would not be saved today. The truth, what? The law shows us our sin. The Ten Commandments shows us our sin. And that Christ loves enough that he sent, that that God loves enough that he sent Jesus Christ to die on the cross for your sin and for my sin. And you know what? You can have eternal life. That's truth. But you know what? We have many people and many religions out there telling people about eternal life, but it doesn't line up with this book. They're lying to people. They're deceiving people. Now, whether it's intentional, I hate to say it, some probably are, or even unintentional. You know what? You need to know truth, and truth is here. And the Holy Spirit will guide us into all truth. Yes, I believe even the person that's sitting here today without Christ, you know what? If you're under conviction, it's the Holy Spirit is teaching you truth. I remember sitting in church before I was saved. And you know what? The Holy Spirit was convicting me about my sin and giving me the truth that as a sinner, if I don't trust Christ, I will spend eternity in the lake of fire. That was truth. And I was thankful for that. Even though I didn't make that decision right away, I still knew the truth. Why does God convict us? Again, that we might change. That we might be restored. Again, why do you discipline your children? You correct them. You want them to know truth. You want to restore them. And not, not only that is what is that we're changed more into the image of Christ. As we're disciplining our children, again, for what purpose? For adulthood. That they might be godly adults different from the worldly people that they will come in contact with. Are we doing that? Again, God wants us, as he convicts us, the whole purpose is that we might be restored, that we might live for him, that we might become more in the image of Christ. Is God convicting you today? Notice some ways that we see conviction brought out here in this passage of Scripture. We see Christ convicting Judas by just the words that he's spoken. Again, in verse number 48, <clears throat> Judas betrayest thou the Son of Man with a kiss. Again, I know we can't really grasp this because we're not there, but think about this for one moment. Here comes Judas. Remember, Judas was what? One of the twelve. Chosen by God. Judas, given power to heal. Judas, who's seen miracles firsthand by Christ as he was with them. The amazing things that Judas saw in his life. Okay, think about that. Now here he comes. And he comes to Christ to give him a kiss. And Christ says, you're betraying me. Now, again, we're going to look at at Judas' response in just a moment. But right now, just think about that. Have you ever had somebody speak something to you and automatically come under conviction? whether it's a Sunday school teacher or whether it's preaching or evangelist, maybe it's even your own personal Bible study, and all of a sudden, you know what, you read a word, and boom, you are convicted. 
Folks, that's a good thing. The words of God, it says in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12 that the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, dividing the sunder of soul and spirit of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. My, God's word is powerful. And Judas knew that and experienced that firsthand. How dare you? And this is not what Christ said. He says, betray us now, the son of man with a kiss. How do you not drop to your knees right then and there and beg for forgiveness? Judas doesn't do that, but we'll come to that, I said, in just a moment. But it's the Word of God. It speaks to us. And whether, again, God uses it through our own personal time or through other people, God's Word will convict us. Notice here in this passage also that people are convicted by the miracles or the wonders of God. Look at verse 50 and 51. Then one of the, uh, and one of them smote the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. And Jesus answered and said, Suffer ye thus far? And he touched his ear and healed him. Again, this amazes me. Maybe you don't think this is conviction, but I'm telling you right now, I'd be convicted. Here's this guy who comes, and I don't know if this soldier even knows why he's there totally, other than the fact that Judas is betraying him. I don't know if he knows the, all, all the outcome or what will be happening, but he knows this. His ear is cut off. And Jesus picks it up and puts it back on. Totally healed. Now, why is he there in the first place? To take Jesus away. And now all of a sudden, he's healed. Wouldn't you stop and think, oh, you know what, maybe I've got to reconsider this. Doesn't happen. I'm telling you, there, there's conviction there. Again, he's not imagining his ear being cut off. It was cut off. There was blood. I'm sure there was pain. I'm sure he saw his ear lying on the ground. Is that mine? Yeah, it's yours. You know, Jesus steps forward to to pick that ear. Why doesn't this guy stab the Lord Jesus Christ? I mean, his ear just got cut off. Maybe he's thinking he's making a move on him, but he doesn't do that. He just stands there. Jesus picks up the ear, puts it on, totally healed. I'm telling you, I'm here to take you away, and you're healing me. That's conviction. I'm telling you, it's conviction. He doesn't see it that way, and we'll talk about that in just a moment as well. Then we see in verse number 61... Or sometimes, you know what, God convicts us just by stirring our hearts, stirring within us. Look at verse number 61. And the Lord turned and looked upon Peter, and Peter remembered. Peter remembered. Remember, Peter, not too long ago, was spouting off his loyalty to the Lord Jesus Christ, and now he denies him three times, and as soon as the the rooster crows, he remembered what the Lord said to him. You know what, we don't have... The, the Lord speaking to us in the aspect like he did here. But you know what? The Holy Spirit that dwells within us stirs our hearts when we are sinning against the Holy God. Now again, in order for you to experience that, you must be saved. Think about this again. As we look, I'm going to give you three verses that talk about the Holy Spirit dwelling within. Now, who is the Holy Spirit, folks? Yes, thank you, Pastor Ryan. One person answered, okay? I know the rest of you knew the answer. You just want to see if Pastor Ryan knew the answer, huh? Yes, I know that, okay? Right, remember, Holy Spirit is God. Now, again, grasp that. He's God. Romans chapter 8, verse 9 says this. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so, be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Who is dwelling within me? God, as a born-again believer, is dwelling in me. Think about that. A holy, righteous, almighty God dwells within me as a believer. Folks, you can't get any more of God than that. But here's the thing. Those that are not saved don't have the Holy Spirit dwelling within them. They don't have God dwelling within them. We are promised and we're told by the word of God that again, that we that know Christ, he dwells within us. 
1 Corinthians 3 and verse 16 says, Know ye not, or excuse me, uh, yeah, know ye not that ye are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you. Folks, again, I don't know if we ever stop to think about God dwells in us unless we see a passage like this or we're reading or whatever that it comes to our mind. Hey, wait a minute here. Wait a minute. I'm Not only am I not alone, God's dwelling in me. In me. Greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. Amen. Folks, if you're a born-again believer, God dwells in you. Do you not know that? We let so, so many times, I think we let the simple things of life pass us by. And the fact that God dwells in us, I think that passes by more than we realize. We are blessed to have a God that dwells within us. 2 Timothy 1, verse 14, that the God which, and the good thing which was committed unto thee, keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us us. You're here today, the Holy Spirit dwells within you if you know Christ as your Savior. Folks, if you don't know Christ as your Savior, you're missing out. Not only on the blessings of God dwelling within you, but you'll miss out on eternal life. I'm telling you right now, you're in this church service, and if you don't know Christ, I'm telling you, you're under conviction. How do I know that? Because I was there. I know. I know what it's like. But you know what? That's God loving you. Enough to convict you of your sin. And even for the believer that's here, God's convicting you of your sin because he loves you. Amen. He wants you to be restored. He wants you to do that, which is right, because God is always about our good. He's never there to harm us, to make life miserable. He loves us, and he has compassion on us, and he convicts us oftentimes as a result of that love. Now, let's look at the response of the three men that we see here who, were, who was convicted. Verse 47, 48, again, we have uh, uh, Judas who's under conviction, okay? But you wouldn't know it, would you? Look at verse 47 again. And while he yet spake, behold, a multitude, and he that was called Judas, came, uh, one of the twelve, went before them and drew near unto them to kiss him. And Jesus said unto him, Judas, betrayest thou the Son of Man with a kiss. Judas had spent years with Christ. He said he loved him. He spent time with him. Saw the compassion that he had, not only upon others, but upon Judas himself. And now he comes to pretend that he loves him again by welcoming him with a kiss. And Jesus looks him in the eye and says, Betrayest thou the Son of Man? Now I'm telling you, where's the conviction? But you have such a hard, rotten attitude like Judas had that you don't even, it doesn't even phase you. Now be, look, be aware of this, folks. If you can go through life sin after sin after sin and not be under conviction, you better examine your heart. Okay? Judas, by all accounts, if we were with them, and we, Judas would have been the man who had been in church. Judas would have been the man that was appeared to give uh, uh, the answers that Jesus gave. Yet, he was a betrayer, he was a deceiver. Does that describe you? Maybe you're just lying to yourself about your salvation. Because if you're never under conviction, we know the Holy Spirit does what? He ch God chastens his children. Okay? I don't go around spanking other people's children, okay? But I spank my own. Amen. Okay? Now, I like to spank somebody else's ch children, but I don't. Do no, I'm just kidding. Right, I'm just kidding. <laughs> But a God who loves us will convict us. And for Judas to be able to sit there and look at the, in the eye of Jesus and not phase him, I'm telling you, that guy has a brazen, cold heart attitude. I'm telling you, nothing's going to change that guy. How do you do that? Does not, does not feel an ounce of guilt, an ounce of conviction. Now, I know later on we read about Judas is feeling guilty there, but... At this moment, 
when conviction should be slapping him right in the face, it's not happening. Okay? But notice the other person here in verses 50 and 51. And one of them that smote the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. And Jesus answered and said, Suffer you thus far. And he touched his ear and healed him. Here's a man that's just totally uninvolved. Okay? He's a, he has this bystander approach, in other words. He's just, he's just there long for the ride. Again, as we mentioned, he had his ear cut off. All right? As much agony as you can think about that, this man was going through that. And then all of a sudden, to be totally healed, and what do you say? Nothing. He never says thank you. He doesn't even acknowledge it. But I'm telling you right here, right now, that if somebody who I went to arrest, again, does he know that he's going to be beat? Does he know that he's going to be crucified? I don't know all the details about that. But I know this. I'm there to take away a guy who's never done a single thing wrong. And on top of that, he just healed me. I'd be second-guessing what I'm doing. Okay, I'm just being honest. I'd be second-guessing that. This guy, nothing. Nothing. Right. Now, you know what? I'd almost rather be Judas than be this guy. You know why? Because this guy, nothing phases him. Okay? A guy who's hard-hearted as Judas may one day be in a conviction. But this guy... I don't know if anything will ever convict him. I mean, this guy has just been healed. It says as, as though God had raised him from the dead. And he's like, well, I'm not so sure I know anything about that. Yeah. This Jesus has all power. And this guy is on a phase. How many people sit in church? And I was one of them, okay? Under conviction, but you know what? I didn't go forward. I didn't think about it once I left the church. This guy, nothing. I'm just telling you, I just can't imagine how many people are uninvolved when the Holy Spirit is convicting them of their sin, and that may be people here today. The Holy Spirit's convicting you, and you're like, mm, take it or leave it, doesn't really matter to me. But notice of Peter. Verse 62, and it says that Peter went out and wept bitterly. Peter was a man broken and ashamed of his sin. This is the response that we all ought to have right here when God convicts us of our sin, broken and ashamed. Peter, again, remember what? Was spouting off loyalty. I don't care what every other man will do, but I will never do that. And then he denies Christ, not once, not twice, but three times. Three times. And then when he hears the rooster crow and Jesus looks on him, he remembers what Christ said. And I'm telling you, he was a broken and ashamed man. Amen. Reminds me of David in Psalm 51. Let me just read to you several verses from Psalm 51, verse number 3, and it says this, For I acknowledge my transgression, and my sin is ever before me. Against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. That sounds just like Peter, doesn't it? Right in the very eyes of Christ, denying him. Verse 7, Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Verse 9, Hide thy face from my sins, and blot, blot out all my iniquities. Verse 10, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Verse 12, Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Verse 16 and 17, For thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. I don't know of any men that were more broken than David in the Old Testament and Peter in the New Testament. Broken and ashamed. And you know what, folks? We dismiss our sin as though, that's ah, no big deal. I'll just ask Jesus to forgive me, and he's, he's obligated to forgive me. I don't know if you're really sorrowful over your sin or not, if that's your attitude. When we're convicted, you know what? Our response ought to be like Peter's, broken and ashamed. Amen. How have I offended my Lord? How have I embarrassed him? 
I'm ashamed of my actions. Repent. That's what Peter did. The right response out of these three men was Peter. The one we always want to cast a shadow upon at times. Oh, Peter, how could you do that? How could you sit there and deny the Lord? How could you lack faith when you're walking on the water? Oh, Peter, I'm so... No, Peter was the only one with the right response. Broken and ashamed. Repentant. When you're convicted and when I'm convicted, what is our response? Are we like Judas? Just cold and hard. Are we like the, the soldier there? That, eh, nothing. Just nothing. Are we like Peter? Broken and ashamed. You know what? And that's what God does for us. He breaks us. Amen. Why? Not to keep us there, but that he might restore us. Amen. That we might have that fellowship with him again and learn from that. As much as conviction may be something we don't care about, don't like, but you know what? It's the work of the Holy Spirit. And it's done out of a heart of love with the purpose of showing us what is right and a desire to restore us to fellowship. You know, that's a God who loves us. One who convicts us. Do we love him? Well, we show that by how we respond to that conviction. I'm going to go ahead and stand. We'll have a word of prayer.